As everyone's filing in, we'd like to get started on our keynote presentation. In order to lay the foundation for the keynote today, we are extremely fortunate to have Judge Phil Restrepo in attendance. As we've emphasized throughout the day, the topic for this year's symposium really originated in Philadelphia. Each of the public interest scholars planning the symposium have sort of adopted Philadelphia as our own, and we wanted a topic that impacted Philadelphia itself. When we were considering who to introduce, who, who might introduce our keynote, Judge Restrepo was at the top of our list. Both a former public, a former Philadelphia public defender and a federal, former federal defender for the Eastern District of Pennsylvania, Judge Restrepo knows this city and its criminal justice system. Most, recent, most recently, Judge Restrepo agreed to provide over, preside over a new federal reentry court program along with Judge Tim Rice. In the program, ex-offenders meet with the judges to discuss topics an ex-offender wouldn't normally talk about with a judge. Where to find a job, how to find affordable housing, and what to do about relationship troubles. The program truly challenges the notion that our judicial system need be confined, confined by that which is criminal or that which is punishing. As a final note, I would like to personally thank Judge Restrepo for not only agreeing to lay the found work, groundwork for J Jeremy Travis's speech, but also for spreading the word throughout the community. By the number of attendees, no doubt some of you came through Judge Restrepo's recommendation. And we thank you for that. Thanks. I'd, I'd like to start by thanking the folks at Penn, particularly the, the uh, young ladies, really, that organized the symposium. They've done tremendous work, and, and you should all be uh, very proud of what you've done here. When they asked me to introduce Jeremy Travis, I'll confess, I didn't know who Jeremy Travis was. So what do you do? You go to Google. And I Googled Jeremy Travis, and lo and behold, it, it dawned on me very quickly, this is an accomplished guy, to say the least. And I could bore you with the details, but I'm going to recommend that you read all about Jeremy Travis right here in this program. That's the long version. I had the privilege of meeting Jeremy Travis last night at, at dinner. We chatted, and I, again, I got to catch up with him a little bit at lunch today. And it's dawned on me that it's not often that you get to meet somebody that has a, had a real profound impact on the system across the board. I mean, at, if, if you read what I read, and if you read the program, you'll realize that Jeremy Travis is the go-to guy on issues surrounding criminal justice issues. Or as they say in the vernacular, he's the man. <laughs> and then on a more personal level, it dawned on me that this program that we're running in Philadelphia, it's, it's known as STAR, which is Supervision to Aid Reentry. It's a program we're running here in Philly, myself and another judge, uh, Tim Rice, meet with ex-offenders every other week for a good while. We also meet with the probation office the U.S. Attorney, and the Public Defender. And I can't tell you how much Tim and I appreciate the institutional support of the court, the defenders, the U.S. Attorney, and probation for giving this a go. Because at the end of the day, we have to try new things. And we have to try new things, and this is one of the new things, really, that Mr. Travis has brought to the table. He's always been at the forefront of criminal justice issues. He was one of the first to talk about police accountability. He was one of the first to talk about victim impact issues. He's among the first to really focus on reentry issues. He thinks outside the box, or as I was talking to Dave Rudolsky, we kind of agreed that he's way ahead of the curve. And I would recommend that on your way out, you pick up copies of President Travis. He doesn't like to be called President Travis, so I'll, I'll call him President Travis. <laughs> some of his testimony uh, before Congress, some of his recent speeches, and some of his recent articles are there for you to take home with you. So without further ado, I give you Jeremy Travis. Thank you very much for that uh, introduction. I'm, I'm gonna try that uh, with my daughters. You're the man. Let's see, we'll see if it, <laughs> it helps at all. Uh, thanks for the invitation to be with you uh, today. This is just a great opportunity uh, for me. It takes a uh, it's a nice change of pace from uh, running uh, John Jay College to come and just uh, listen carefully to what you've been talking about uh, uh, throughout the morning. Uh, I too commend the organizers for the conference. I had a, a wonderful experience uh, meeting with you at dinner last night and you've just done a terrific job putting together a really stellar, uh, you don't know how stellar the group is, I'm not talking about me, I'm talking about everyone, 
some of, some of the people who are my heroes in this world, Mark Maurer, uh, Robin Steinberg, uh, uh, Dean Esserman, uh, Chuck Ramsey, I think is coming later, um, and then some former colleagues of mine, Katarina Roman and Emily Turner from the Urban Institute uh, are here, Sarah Hart, my predecessor at NIJ. So you've really um, done just a spectacular job. Um, so congratulations uh, to all of you. Uh, it, it was fun being introduced by uh, Judge Restrepo. Um, not the introduction, but sort of getting to know him, because he and I sat in the, in the corner in the, whatever, I guess it's a classroom, it became a lunchroom, and uh, it, it was like sitting uh, in, the, in the mayor's corner. The, you know, everyone came up to say hello, Some, someone came up to borrow money. Uh, <laughs> so, it's true, so, you know, how are you doing? Uh, so the, he's clearly sort of a major uh, mover uh, in the criminal justice community. Uh, here. So here's what we're going to do for the next um, half hour, 45 minutes or so. Um, and I want you to ask you just to step back from some of the discussions we've been having uh, throughout the morning and to go on a sort of big journey with me uh, to try to understand how we got to where we are in terms of our current state of imprisonment uh, in America. And this won't be so much a how speech as a describe it speech. This is a problem statement speech. And my hope is that you'll um, feel more, um, you'll feel that tension between being depressed and being optimistic. I always like to be on the optimistic side, but sometimes it's important just to realize and recognize and name our reality, just uh, uh, where we are. I will try my best, because this is a big topic, I've written books on it, I'm try to squeeze it down, they say you got half an hour, I'll try my best. Uh, to leave time for questions and answers, because that's the most fun for me, uh, but also the most helpful, I would hope, for the, for the discussion. So that's what we're going to do, okay? Ready? Fasten your seatbelts. Here we go. Uh, some of this builds on and expands upon things you've heard from others, uh, but let's just put, uh, we'll talk about reentry, but you can't talk about reentry while I talk about incarceration. So we want to start by talking about uh, incarceration. I think it's a fair characterization to say that over the past uh, 30 years, um, anybody born over 1972, I'm talking about your life after 1972, this is uh, certainly in my generation, my professional generation, over the past 30 years, uh, our country, our democracy has embarked on what can fairly be characterized as one of the, the, the most uh, far-reaching social experiments in our nation's history. And how can we describe this social experiment? Up until that year, uh, for the previous 50 years, our country had a relatively stable rate of incarceration. By rate, you know, the social scientists in the room know what we mean. Those who did fourth grade math and remember it know what I mean. It's a number over a number. So the rate is not the number of people in prison, but it's the, the uh, number of people incarcerated per 100,000. So for the previous 50 years, our rate of incarceration was about 110 per 100,000. In 1972, we started to increase both the absolute number, but more importantly, the rate of incarceration in America. And for every year since then, we've put more people in prison, and that rate has increased. So 50 years of stability, followed by, do the math, 35 plus years of, of growth. And the growth has not been minor. It's not been, uh, uh, it's been steady. Year to year, it feels like not much, 2%, 6%. But you add those up over a 30 year period, and you have uh, the following reality. We have, over that period of time, quadrupled the per capita rate of incarceration in this country, starting in 1972. So that's a big statement to make. We've quadrupled it. So let's, let's try to sort of put that in some other historical uh, context. Uh, we've, in, we've put more people in prison every year. We put more people in prison in times of war, times of peace. We put more people in prison when crime has been going up and when it's been going down. We put more people in prison when uh, the economy has been strong and when it's been weak. We have decided to put lots more people in prison. And the we is a collective decision that we've made through our elected officials. We have made this decision. It's not somebody else. It's our country. So the quadrupling of the incarceration rate in America leaves us, as Mark Maurer said, in this remarkable stance in the rest of the world, which is that we have incarceration rates that set us apart from every other country in the world certainly far uh, outstripping the rates in, in, uh, in Western Europe, and we have recently in the past several years surpassed uh, both South Africa and Russia. It's another example of American exceptionalism 
that along with, until recently, torture and still the death penalty and other ways of thinking about our uh, the way we react to wrongdoing, uh, we stand apart from the rest of the world. So if you travel anywhere in the world and you talk about uh, punishment rates, I mean, this is what I do when I travel. I say, hey, what's your punishment rate? <laughs> Most people say, you know, can I have the local wine? But uh, if, you, if this is sort of the way you want to look at the world, you'll see that, that people look at us and say, what have you done in America? And uh, I think that's a fair question. So some scholars, uh, and I've used this phrase, say that we've now entered an era of mass incarceration. And that is the defining reality uh, that I want to focus on. Before talking a bit about what it means for our society to have so many people in prison and jail, what I'd like to do is to ask you to recognize that this retributive impulse, this American uh, impulse that, uh, that we've expressed so, um, so powerfully, is not expressed solely in the increase of the rates of imprisonment. That this retributive impulse, this uh, reflexive uh, punitive reaction, finds its way through other outlets in our system of laws. So I want to focus on just a couple. Uh, one is that the parole system has also been, in essence, hijacked by the same retributive impulse and is a, um, a shadow of its former self. It barely resembles what it was, uh, how it was originally set up. This is an American invention. Uh, and parole is now different in a number of important ways. First of all, this is a national statement. Not, I don't know the Pennsylvania data here. Um, but we have significantly decreased the number, the number, both number and percentage of people who are released through discretionary means. More people are now released automatically. They, they max out, whatever the phrase is, they reach that point. So to the extent that there is a decision you're trying to influence by your behavior while you're incarcerated, I'm going to get a job when I you know, line up a job to get out, I'm going to line up housing for when I get out and get my family ready to accept me so I have a good parole application. I'm going to do things in prison, like behave, like take part in programs, do things that will help influence that discretionary decision. There's no discretionary decision anymore for people who are now max, uh, maxing out under the changes in our statutes. Secondly, we place many more people on supervision, not many more, but a percentage of them coming out than ever before. Uh, it w was as high as 84%, it's now down, I'm told, in the, in the, in the high 70s. It used to be about 50, 60% of the people when, when released were placed on supervision. So now we place more people on supervision, so we have extended state control over a larger percentage of the people coming out of prison, and we're putting more people in prison, so we have more people under this sort of state supervision. And very importantly, we have changed the nature of supervision and the way in which we use our legal powers to send people back to prison for violating their supervision. We have changed the nature by, by making it more surveillance op, uh, oriented, less um, uh, sort of support oriented, less service oriented. We use technologies in a very different way than ever before, in part just because they're available, uh, like drug testing, like GPS systems. Uh, but we're, and we're much more risk averse uh, than we used to be in the past. The net effect of all of that is more people on supervision, different uh, philosophy of supervision, uh, a more law enforcement orientation rather than a service orientation, and less uh, um, uh, uh, willing to take risks, more risk averse, as our whole system is, less willing to allow discretion to be exercised, as our whole system is. And we have the following remarkable statistic. Put all that together, in 1980, 200,000 people or so were sent to state or federal prison for any reason. In 2000, 200,000 people were sent to prison merely for violating the parole. So the phrase I've coined to talk about this part of our sort of justice phenomenon is that we've created a system of back-end sentencing. We've, we are, in essence, punishing people for misconduct the, the dirty urine, the uh, missed appointment, the uh, failure to keep curfew, as well as, in some cases, about a third of them, new crimes. And we've created this system of churning at the back end, lots of people coming in and out of prison because they're violating their, their parole. A system that, uh, uh, of sentencing that has escaped all of the, the, the jurisprudential discussion that happens in fine law schools like this one about sentencing. If we were to think for a second, I have a member of the Sentencing Commission here. Where is he? I just saw him. Somebody's here from the Sentencing Commission. There he is, yes. If we were to think about applying at the state level 
the, the, the same analysis about treating like cases alike, about concern for racial disparity, about guided discretion, at the back end of our system, where we have back end sentencing, as we do at the front end, it would not withstand scrutiny for a, for a nanosecond. So we have deprived liberty in, in large scale to lots of people through our system of back-end sentencing. So that's one way in which our retributive impulse, in addition to building more prisons, has played out. And the argument I want to make here is that this stands in the way of successful reentry. Right? You see where I'm headed? Lots more people in prison, lots more coming out. And we've changed the systems of, of release and reintegration. The second big change we've made, reflecting the same retributive impulse, impulse that's been abroad in the country, is to create Again, Mark Maurer and I uh, coined this phrase, we hope you all use it so we get credit, uh, invisible punishment. Uh, he wrote the book, I wrote the chapter. What we mean by that is, this is different from collateral, uh, collateral effects, collateral consequences, which we can talk about in a different way. Invisible punishment are the punishments that are enacted by our state legislatures. They are, they are creatures of the law, but, they fall on the person, they punish the person outside of the courtroom. So li listen to some of the things that are on this list, and I hope you'll understand what I mean. And they're the easiest punishments for legislators to enact. It's like a hot knife through butter. You don't have to have a citing decision about where to put a prison. You don't have to think about the costs of anything. You don't have to hold a hearing on these things. The public loves them because they make, the, make you feel good. So what have we done? We have... Um, Let's go through a little list. Uh, our, start at the federal level. Our federal government decided in the mid-90s that people uh, convicted of certain offenses, mostly drug offenses, are no longer eligible for public assistance. That punishment falls now by virtue of law. Food stamps, uh, same thing. Uh, in some cases, the federal government has done some very interesting things with uh, creating incentives for states to get tougher so you can't get your highway money unless you have a statute that denies uh, driving privileges to people convicted of certain offenses. So another type of invisible punishment that denies people their driving privileges. Um, public housing is a classic example through federal regulation, basically. Uh, in, I was part of the Clinton administration, so I'm not particularly proud of this, but the one strike uh, legislation was enacted which says that you can be denied public housing access to public housing, both Section 8 and, uh, and public housing itself, uh, if you have been convicted of certain drug offenses. And so this means that it doesn't matter on some level whether the family, your family is the best place for you in terms of your reintegration after you come out of prison. If your family happens to live in public housing, you can be denied the, the right, in essence, it's not a right, but to return to your family. So we, that's another form of invisible punishment. Some of the uh, other ones that fall under this category are um, Increased uh, registration, with, uh, particularly for sex offenders, with, with the police. Uh, greater likelihood to uh, terminate parental rights. Um, exclusion of large numbers of, of jobs uh, from, uh, from your sort of potential job search. Uh, health uh, jobs put off um, out, of, out, of, uh, out of bounds. Uh, you can't work in an airport. Uh, you know, so we've taken large sectors of the labor market and through invisible punishment, these are legislative enactments, by and large have said, you cannot work here because you now have a felony conviction. So the invisible punishment and the, see how they work together, and the, uh, the changes in the nature and form and uh, operations of supervision, more people on state control, supervised more closely, revoked more frequently, in and out of prison for short stays on the revocation, and as you try to do the things that are associated with, with successful reintegration, uh, much more difficult uh, to make it happen. So these new realities of punishment reflect uh, in, in the broadest strokes uh, changes in our sentencing philosophy. We, so a reasonable question for a historian or somebody who wants to think about sentencing is how did we get here? What happened in the 70s? Long discussion. We won't be able to do it justice at all here today. But the short answer is, uh, the same consensus, what Michael Tonry calls the golden era of, uh, of American sentencing jurisprudence that, that prevailed for, uh, for the better part of a century of indeterminate sentencing, for a variety of reasons that fell apart in the early 70s. Indeterminate sentencing, you're law students, I don't have to explain it, you're lawyers, I don't have to explain it, but you know, it's basically this, alloc I like to think of it as an allocation of power between what the legislative branch is authorized to do, set broad terms, what the judicial branch, branch is authorized to do is to sentence you within those terms, 
And what the executive branch does through the exercise of parole powers is to decide when to release you at some point in your, in your sentence. I'm not concerned that this mic's not working. I'm still talking. Can you still hear me? Okay. We're going to go ahead because we've got a lot of ground to cover. So I think of this, we can think of this in, in so lawyerly terms as uh, sort of what's this, what does the sentence look like? I want to think of it in terms of political power. Who makes the decision? So that's, but we have to remember that this was, there was intellectual ferment in the 70s that attacked this system from left and right. It was attacked from the right as being soft on crime, coddling criminals, too much discretion to those unelected judges. What? We hear that all the time. It was attacked from the left, my left friends don't like to remember this, as being uh, forced uh, therapy and treatment, as being uh, racially uh, uh, disparate in terms of outcomes, as being a uh, sort of uh, inappropriate uh, allocation of power uh, to the executive branch. So it fell apart. Now we still have an indeterminate sentencing, lots of states, but the idea that this was the way we sentence people around the country, that has fallen apart. The model penal code idea no longer exists as the norm within the country. It used to be every 50 state, every one of the 50 states, the federal system, DC, everybody practiced some version of that. It's now a hodgepodge sort of patchwork quilt of, of sentencing philosophy. The reason I focus on the, on the change in political power, I have to shout a little bit more. Is the microphone even working? No, it's, I don't think it's me. I think it's the... Ready? Some, something happened with the microphone. I'll, I'll use it as best I can. So the reason I focus on the, on the changing uh, allocation or, or distribution of political power is the basic point I want to leave you with, because I think this affects the, uh, our going forward strategies, is that we have democratized punishment. We have said that punishment, the, out, the decision as to, as to how we as a society respond to certain crimes has been increasingly taken over as the province of our elected branches of government. As the, as the center fell apart in indeterminate sentencing, this allocation of powers uh, switched and we decided that we would uh, democratize punishment, it became fairly easy, frankly, for somebody running for state office to say in response to crime, which was going up, don't forget, in the late 60s, early 70s, went up for a while, down, and then up in the, in the late 80s, down in the 90s, uh, the easiest response to a, a constituent concern about crime was, you elect me, I'm going to pass a law. What laws can you pass that will be responsible to crime? Not many. All you can do is be tough. Not all you can do, but the easiest thing to do is be tough. And you're putting the costs into the out years and maybe you'll get reelected, maybe you won't. But it became sort of the, when we say tough on crime became an elected, um, sort of a political slogan that worked. It's working again. Uh, how did it work? It translated from the public concern about crime into an election uh, platform, a campaign platform, campaign promise to do something. What can a state official do? Uh, the easiest thing to do is to increase punishment. And so the intellectual vacuum left by the decline of the consensus about, about indeterminate sentencing made it easier in an interesting way, I think, for elected officials to say, this is what I'm going to do. So the most extreme example of the democratization of punishment can be found in our, our poster child for how to do things wrong, California. <laughs> and we've seen this on left and right. What did the right do? They designed three strikes. The three strikes legislation, that's, uh, I should not have used the word legislation, the three strikes referendum item, now embedded in the California state constitution, was never enacted by the legislature, never had a legislative hearing because it was put directly on the, ref on the ballot uh, as a matter of public referendum and therefore very hard to get, to get rid of. Constitutional challenges have basically failed. So one reason that California is in the pickle it's in is because they, the public, enacted the three strikes legislation. The left responded by saying, we can do this too. And Proposition 30 something, 34, 30, the one that says mandatory drug treatment, yep, that went right to the ballot also. So we've democratized punishment. The point I've made in, in, uh, in the writings that I've done here is that in all of this ferment, we have lost track of the very important reality, uh, which is that everybody we put in prison comes home. We have lost track of the, of the fact of reentry. Now, let me just uh, sort of unpack that sentence because 
this is a very sophisticated audience, but just to make sure, follow with me closely. Unless you die in prison, either of natural causes or you're executed, you're coming out. Everybody comes back, hence the title of the book, but they all come back. We've lost track of that, what I call the iron law of imprisonment, which is everybody comes back unless you die. So we put many more people in prison. They're there for, I don't know what a relatively short period of time is, but it's less than three years on average, and they all come home. Many more people in prison means many more people coming home. So the reentry statistic that I hope still gets people's attention is this year we have 700,000 people coming out of state and federal prison, 1,900 people a day, and in, in the uh, early uh, 1980s, late 1970s, it was about um, a quarter of that. So, and you've heard the descriptions before, this is mostly about men, it's 90% men, it's uh, by a slight majority, men of color, and for me, the most important fact to remember in the incarceration and reentry phenomenon, thinking about it and its impact on our society, is that this phenomenon is concentrated in a small number of communities. So the same communities that you're gonna hear about later, after I uh, finish my talk, from the police panel, same communities where violence is concentrated, the same individuals, it's a small number of people responsible for, large, for a large percentage of violence. These communities, already struggling with uh, lousy schools, poor health care, weak labor markets, uh, all sorts of terrible financial sort of redlining practices, these same communities, typically communities of color, are now being asked by our democracy to bear the burden, the responsibility, the work, hard work, of reintegrating record numbers of people coming back home. This is unprecedented in our society. So when we talk about doing things at community level and we talk about reentry, for me, the, you know, we can do stuff at a jurisdiction level, city level, uh, system level. For me, the only, name, only game in town is to do stuff at a community level because this is where the, the pain is being felt. This is where the work is being done. So this requires us to rethink everything we do in this, in this world. So just to do a quick survey of who should be at a local reentry table, um, and when I was at the Urban Institute, and Emily and I did this work, and, uh, and John Roman as well, uh, we did some work here in Philadelphia, which was, um, I hope, productive for everybody, mapping out where the reentry, incarceration reentry population comes from and therefore goes back to. This is where you have to do the hard work. Who should be at that table and why? And why is it interesting that the reentry movement is bringing so many different, uh, it's not just a bipartisan movement. I mean, the Second Chance Act was, comes out of President George W. Bush's 2004 State of the Union address. The most eloquent words uttered by an elected official in America, in my estimation, were, el were uttered by George Bush in that uh, State of the Union address. So it's a broadly bipartisan uh, movement reentry. You know, it was the evangelical right and the Congressional Black Caucus pushing for the Second Chance Act. So there's something interesting happening here. But the test is whether at community level we can do things very differently. And that's sort of the, the, the punchline of, of the testimony I gave last week in Congress. So who should be at this table at the community level? It's not the usual suspects. And why? Let me just give you sort of the who and why. At the table have to be the police. First and foremost, why? Because this is, at bottom, a public safety issue. The recidivism rate of people coming out of prison, BJS data, it's two-thirds over three years get rearrested for one or more serious crimes. We are dealing with a very high-risk population. And they are at risk coming out. There's a lot of gang retaliations, a lot of stuff happening, and they are at risk of causing harm to others. You can't begin the reentry conversation unless you talk about the risk they pose. Police have to be at the table. Police can't be at the table in the way that they've, they've been at the table before. This is not about more surveillance, more uh, uh, tracking and the like. They have to be at the table in a very different way. Second group at the table, workforce development people. We were talking about this uh, during the lunch. Why? Another statistic, a little cocktail chatter this evening. You say, I learned something interesting today. Here it is. The mere fact of having been in prison, if you compare somebody to exactly the same people, the mere fact that this guy over here was in prison means that his earnings over his lifetime are 10 to 30% lower than this guy. 
It's not that they don't get jobs. And in fact, it's interesting that half of people had full-time jobs before they went into prison. It's they get lousy jobs and they can't advance. Why can't they advance? Because they get lousy jobs, they don't have, don't have the, but they can't move as, as mobily as others might move. And we've taken these men out of community at a time when we have those apprenticeships, when we make our first mistakes, when we connect to a boss, when we figure out how to get promoted, during that time in their lives. So they're not coming with the same human capital. So the workforce development have to, people have to be at the table. The health people have to be at the table. Why? Because in prison, the prison population presents in terms of health issues, communicable diseases, mental illness, addiction, uh, sexually transmitted diseases, all of these things present at levels four to ten times higher uh, than the uh, general population. So the public health people, interesting, I love these people, are sort of thinking about how do we work in prison on communicable diseases before people come out, connect them back to health care on the outside. Child welfare and uh, family um, service folks have to be at this table. Why? Because we have so many young people who have a parent in prison. So another little statistic to take home is 7.8% uh, of all minor African-American children in prison as we speak today have one or two parents in prison. That's just a snapshot today. It's not over time. Over time, it's much, much bigger than that. So 40% uh, of all children uh, who enter foster care do so because their parents are arrested. So the whole, the whole sort of, so, and this is just a statement about the, their consequences to quadrupling the rate of incarceration. And those consequences are in the system that I've talked about, but also all of these social service agencies. In essence, and Robin Steinberg was talking about this before, we, we've created a way in which Everybody's in the justice business, which is just so bizarre, right? But that's in part because that's where their clients are. So who, should, who else should be there? Uh, we should have the uh, community development people there because the impact of incarceration is, uh, is very acute in terms of uh, community capacity. Um, so the reentry table that you can envision at a community level would have all of these people and others at the table. You'd have the faith institutions there, you'd have the elected officials, you'd have uh, organizations representing formerly incarcerated people there. But we have, we have so we, we, we can do what Robin described as a sort of palliative work or, or sort of um, make, try to make things better. Uh, but I want to just uh, focus on communities for a second and then talk a bit about where we can go from here. And then we'll take some questions. Community is, is the, uh, it's, 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 it's the, it's the construct within, within which I think we can best understand the consequences of our, um, our grand experiment. The consequences, I've mentioned a lot of them. Let me just add the voting rights consequence. Uh, so some states, and, and Mark Maurer and the Sensing Project have done the cutting edge of work on this topic. And I, I forget, I don't keep track anymore, but I think it's like six or seven states, you can't vote for life once you have a felony conviction. So at the community level, let's try to understand this. We have large numbers of men, very small numbers of women, mostly men, communities of color, living in not only diminished status in terms of their ability to do all these other things, but diminished citizenship status, at least for the period of time when they're, they're under supervision. And there are two states where you can vote while you're in prison, like Europe, uh, Vermont and Maine, but. 48, you can't, so you can't vote while you're in prison. In most states, you can't vote while you're in supervision. And in this handful of states, you can't vote while you're, uh, for the rest of your life. So concentrate all of those things I've just said that are sort of nice uh, sort of law review article type of things about these statutes where you can see some law professor getting really excited about this. But look at it at a community level. It means that you can have upwards of a third of the men in that community who can't vote for life in those states. So just imagine your, your, your political process. You're, in, you're somebody who wants to run for office. You go around and try to get your votes, right? And you know, one in three of the, of the men that you run into can't, vote, can't even vote for you, much less vote on something that might be important to him or her. Another community capacity issue, gender relationships. Uh, Donald Brayman, one of my favorite writers in this, this area, has looked at the community effects of community concentration in Washington, D.C and coined a phrase very useful called the gender imbalance. So in these communities, because you have lots of men off in prison and lots of men coming back and basically of diminished 
uh, sort of interest in terms of their marriageability, by which I mean their life prospects, their working, their uh, sort of who they're hanging out with. Um, and you have terrific imbalances, by terrific I don't mean good, I mean significant imbalances between men and women in those communities. So this is influencing dating patterns, what does it mean, and identity, gender identity, what does it mean to grow up male, right, if, if the normative event is you go off to prison, right, that's, that's sort of the modal event is you go off to prison, uh, and what does it mean for the young women in that community, much less the children whose parents are in prison who were never, we never intended to punish them, right, but they're getting punished uh, indirectly. And finally, just to make this a sort of a long-term proposition, and if you're not depressed enough already, uh, just to try one more thing, uh, we like to think as, as Americans that one of the, the, the aspirations we have is to leave something for the next generation, right? We want our kids to be as least well off as we are, right? That's, you know, that's why we work hard, that's why we get education. You know, on some level, it's, it's, it's sort of something about mortality that's, I can't go there, but we want our kids to do better than we did, right? in lots of ways, and one of them is financial. So the way that usually happens is you accumulate savings, you build a business, you, you, know, you invest, you do all sorts of things. Uh, uh, Brayman also, has, and somebody else, and I think Richard Freeman has done this too, is trying to track the, the diminished intergenerational transfer of wealth in the African American community because so much wealth is being eaten up by our prison system. It's the, it's the wealth, it's the asset that's eaten up by saying I have to ship money off to commissary for my kid, I have to travel you know, once a month 200 miles each way and stay in a hotel to see my kid or to see my, uh, my son. Uh, I've got, he was working before he was arrested, he's not working so I've got to make up for that lost income. Uh, when he comes back home, he's not working, he's sleeping back on the couch, uh, I've got to feed him. So just think about the, the and, and then there's the diminished uh, lifetime earnings. So we have done something very profound uh, in this country that uh, is having ripple effects that are uh, significant. And uh, the one that I think is uh, the most uh, problematic is uh, the way in which our decision, again, our collective decision to go in this direction, uh, the way in which I think it's most uh, problematic is the impact it is having and will have on our pursuit of racial justice and our respect for the law. So let me just make two observations about that and then we'll take some questions. Uh, every speaker before uh, me and certainly many of the questions that you asked uh, concentrated on the, excuse me, the racial dimensions of our criminal justice system. I won't underscore that uh, except to say that incarceration is, is, is taking a deep bite uh, into the uh, communities of color in ways that are uh, reinforcing uh, racial stereotypes, playing into uh, the way in which uh, we think about each other as Americans of, uh, of different color. Uh, uh, some of the commentators uh, here, um, Manning Marable and others, have referred to this as the fourth chapter of the African experience in New York, in New York, where am I, uh, in America. So first chapter, slavery, second chapter, Jim Crow, third chapter, residential segregation in the North, fourth chapter, incarceration. So when you put it in this context and you say, what progress have we made in terms of our pursuit of racial justice? Uh, and you realize how intractable, this is not like Jim Crow. This is not like, ironically, slavery. How do we get out of this box? And are you depressed yet, right? I just wanna make sure you sort of get a full head of steamer. So I think, I think this is deeply, deeply troubling and should be uh, to anybody who cares about our democracy and our particular experiment in, uh, in being a multicultural society. And then the final thought, and this is for the uh, law students in the room. Uh, I've become very uh, concerned, and I'm, my work here is informed, my thinking here is informed by the work of uh, a number of people, David Kennedy among them, about the ways in which this uh, very heavy burden that we've placed on communities of color, uh, that our society is sort of uh, in this uh, sort of mode, uh, the way it's uh, influencing the relationships between those communities and our system of laws, and in essence, undermining the respect for the rule of law. And this is, sounds maybe overstated, but I, I don't think it is. Uh, and David, uh, Kennedy, and if you don't know his work, I would commend it to you, uh, and uh, Doug Tompkins, another uh, colleague of ours at, uh, at John Jay, uh, and Tracy Mears from the Yale Law School, 
are looking at this question of legitimacy. So how is the legitimacy of everything we've talked about today influenced, and we would argue undermined, by the era of mass incarceration? And uh, the work of the justice system, all the agencies of the justice system, depends in large part on the this reciprocal relationship between the system, the, the people who, who do the work, and the governed. And the reciprocal relationship has something to do about legitimacy and respect for the rule of law. And the most extreme sort of interpretation of the stop snitching movement, you know, the idea that you know, nobody cooperates with the police in, uh, in poor communities, is that it's this manifestation of, a, of an opt-out philosophy that I am not going to allow myself, even if I saw what happened, even if I'm not personally involved, I am not at risk, I'm not gonna allow myself to facilitate the operations of that system because it has lost legitimacy in my eyes. Within the system, we call that witness intimidation. I think that's the, a misnomer. I think there's something much more profound going on. Yes, there's intimidation. Yes, you gotta do something about it, but there's something deeper and very troubling about the loss of legitimacy in the system. And I first came across this, I did a lot of work on uh, domestic violence issues when I was, years ago. And I first came across this issue when uh, we were talking about mandatory arrest policies. And if, you know, it, it's like that picture of the, of the, of the O.J. Simpson verdict when you had the, the, uh, the picture of the, of the, I think it was the college campus, white students over here and African-American students over here in terms of the reactions to that verdict. You get that same picture when we talk about mandatory arrest policies uh, in terms of the, the willingness uh, to, uh, to sort of use the system, to sort of uh, invoke the powers of the system. So I think long term we have to be very concerned that our ramping up of incarceration and the sort of the penumbra that have flowed from that same retributive impulse in terms of visible punishment and, and, uh, and, and extensive supervision, extensive state control, this penetration uh, into uh, communities of color added to the uh, increased use of low-level uh, police enforcement tactics, and the speech that I have on the table there tries to put all of that together, we've created just a very different reality. Uh, and we have to look at them all in uh, simultaneously. Because the reality that's important is not what's the right sentence for this person. The reality is important, that's important is what does it mean to grow up in America. Thank you very much.